Hello, my name is Anthony Fox. I am the Division Chief at the DC Department of Health, our HIV, AIDS, Hepatitis, STD, and TB Administration. We welcome you to our presentation on our housing independence through employment program that we have here in the DC EMA. Along with me doing this presentation are two of my fellow colleagues, Mr. Baron Bell, who serves as the Administrative Service Specialist for the DC Department of Health, as well as Ms. Jordan Kimmer, who is a senior case manager for one of our community collaborative partners, Housing Counseling Services. So to give a little brief introduction as well as talk about the agenda, next slide please. We're just gonna kind of walk through a quick little agenda of how we're doing this presentation. I'll do a brief introduction and then I will pass the baton to Mr. Bell who will set the stage, talk a little bit about the problem and the situations that are occurring and the Washington DC EMA. Then I will come back and introduce our collaborative partner, which is Housing Counseling Services, and then they will take the baton and tell us, tell you about the program that we're having called our Housing Independence Through Employment. So to give you a little introduction uh, regarding the work that we are doing here in the Washington DC EMSA, uh, we were at, at some point in our work started looking at our transitional program and was really trying to make sure that we were addressing the needs of persons living with HIV who were part of our transitional program. One of the things that we were thinking about was how do we give them some, some very sustainable skills, sustainable life uh, lessons, some life skills to help them be more sustainable in their everyday living existence while also helping them to become very housing having housing sufficiency and being housing stable as we move them along the housing continuum. So we created a demonstration project, which is the Housing Independence Through Employment Project um, that we, was a workforce development, economic development type of program to support our HIV, persons living with HIV who are part of our transitional housing program. So I will ask Mr. Bale if he will now please set the stage for the problem that existed in the EMSA. Yes, thank you, Mr. Fox. Uh, first of all, we have a situation in Washington, D.C. and some other uh, metropolitan statistical areas might be experiencing that this also. We are in a high housing cost area. In 2017, the Senate asked for HUD to do a special study to look at high housing cost areas and what were the problems. And within this study, out of 30 areas listed as high housing metropolitan statistical areas, DC ranked number six. In 2017, the US Census Bureau of HUD released additional data on the 15th largest metropolitan statistical areas in the US. And what you see here on our slide here, when it comes to the census data on median housing costs, San Francisco is number one with $2,095 a month. DC ranked number two at $1,844 a month. Number 15, which is the last metropolitan statistical area to rank Detroit, the median housing cost for the month was $937. So you can see in DC and San Francisco and some of the other housing cost areas is twice that of some of the other areas in the country. The actual median rents in this same study showed San Francisco at 1815, and it showed DC number two again at 1,475, and Detroit, the last highest ranked area, was at $720 a month. Next slide, please. So what we are faced with, and what many of you are faced with, in 2016, the HACMA Act was passed, which basically changed the HACMA Housing Opportunity for Persons with AIDS funding formula. What that did is that it moved from cumulative AIDS cases and HIV cases to living HIV cases. What, means, what that means is that the formulas now will change and jurisdictions who have been getting the majority of that money, your percentages over time will shrink. So what we're facing here is we have higher rate rent increases in these high cost areas but the incomes of persons are lower. Their income rates increases are much lower. 
which means we have fewer available vouchers. So something must be done to get persons who are able to work to work so that we can get them off the voucher program, or if not, so that the subsidies that we pay will be much lower. And now we're going to give it to uh, our partner. Well, I'll send it back to Mr. Fox and he can introduce our partner. Thank you, Mayor. Of course, as you know, in this Zoom world, we always have to make some adjustments based on doing this. But I also want to thank uh, very clear about our, we at HOSTA, definitely, which is HOSTA is short for our HIV AIDS Services Administration at the DC Department of Health. We definitely work very collaboratively with a lot of our community partners as we think about how do we really maintain and address these housing needs. And one of those partners is Housing Counseling Services. Housing Counseling Services is, is also serves as our single point of entry for most of all our housing programs um, that we have. They are, you know, a lot of the services have been free to the community since 1970 and 1972. And they've just been very much a very big, big part of the work that we do when it comes to doing the work that we do to help those persons who are living with HIV and AIDS in the metropolitan DC eligible statistical area. So I am going to ask that Ms. Jordan Kemmer, please talk to us and tell us a little bit more in detail about our housing independence through employment program. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. So I'm gonna walk us through what HEIGHT actually is. So that's housing independence through employment for short, we call it HEIGHT. Um, so HEIGHT is a 24 month employment and housing program for highly motivated individuals. And so when we're talking about highly motiva motivated individuals, we're looking for people who are in an active state of change. So people who are ready to progress in their employment and their housing goals. Um, the program specifically provides financial support for housing and employment enhancements. And we'll get into de more detail about that in a pretty significant uh, component of the program is that uh, it provides an escrow account. So ten, our participants pay 30% of their income as a rental contribution, all of which goes into an escrow account that eventually is returned to them when they complete the program. Um, so that's a really unique component of the program that, we, again, we'll talk about more as I continue. Um, so our target population are single adults in the DC area that meet the um, Ryan White EMA criteria. Um, and the main point of height is really looking at employment as the pathway to housing stability. Um, like uh, Farron and Anthony touched on, this is a kind of a new shift trying to remold kind of traditional housing programs. Um, so the program goals are to help every participant um, reach their highest level of economic and housing independence. Um, so economic independence, really we're trying to help people move from jobs to careers, um, trying to help individuals achieve some kind of economic mobility um, and access some of the opportunity, which I will say in DC, we do have quite a bit of opportunity in terms of trade programs, um, employment programs. Um, so we are fortunate to be able to leverage some of those services to try to help people progress um, towards economic independence. So the second component is housing independence. So right in line with economic independence, um, as people increase their income, the expectation is that they get to a point where they can maintain housing independently. Ideally, that would be through maintaining market rent or progressing towards home ownership. Um, but we do you know, work really hard to identify realistic and affordable housing options for people. So we do leverage um, some of our workforce housing programs that are, uh, or, that are created or targeted towards middle income earners. So that's our inclusionary zoning programs, affordable dwelling units. Um, there's a lot of tax credit programs. I know that the, a lot of these programs have different names nationally, but that's a good, um, intervention or component to look into when you're considering a program like height. Um, an important part piece of this program is to acknowledge that this housing and employment program is not intended for those in need of permanent supportive housing. It's for those who really do have the capacity to progress towards economic independence and ultimately housing independence. Um, so a little more detail about the specific program. In January 2018, um, this we received um, the, the demonstration project was implemented at Housing Counseling Services. Um, 11 participants who had been in a similar program previously were transferred to our agency and we were tasked with 
working with them and guiding them through this program for the remaining 12 months in the program. Um, some of the things we observed were we observed a lot of employment maintenance versus mobility. So we saw people kind of stagnate in their careers, working hard, maintaining their careers, but not really moving beyond um, like uh, minimum wage jobs. Um, and then we also noticed quite a bit of lack of financial literacy, people struggling to prioritize bills, rent payments. Even though rent payments were going to an escrow account, we saw people not really prioritizing that monthly payment. Um, so with that, uh, with those observations, we started restructuring the demonstration project, which eventually evolved into what we know um, as height today. Um, so restructuring involved um, implementing some mechanism as, mechanisms of accountability, financial literacy curriculum, um, identifying realistic employment plans, um, really focusing um, our efforts into motivational interviewing and then identifying what stages of change participants were in, um, and really shifting away from this is a housing program to this is an employment program that provides housing. Um, so a little slight different shift than a lot of traditional programs. So again, um, kind of speaking to the second cohort, um, when, as we restructured and developed height, um, we created what is height today and we started enrollment in May 2018 for new participants. Um, and so key focuses were that this is an employment program. The criteria we developed, everything we did, um, was really focused on helping people make career enhancements. Um, so our basic eligibility criteria, as I previously outlined, but on top of that, we added that a GED or high school diploma was required, that everyone had, all applicants had to submit a 24 month employment plan. So very clear, what are you gonna do over the next 24 months to increase your income essentially. And then we also needed to see that people had prior employment history. So we were looking for 24 months of employment or educational activities over the past five years um, to really show that people had the capacity to work. So this criteria was developed really seeking individuals with a higher functioning baseline. Um, it's important to know that this program is not appropriate for everyone. Um, as like Anthony touched on, this is just one piece of the housing continuum. This is like the next step after, potentially after transitional housing for people that have really spent some time working on things like getting your GED or high school diploma, entering a trade program and really need that next step up to get out of potentially get out of these systems. Um, that, that's ultimately the goal. Um, so like I said, May 2018, we started enrolling new participants and year to date, there's been 19 people who participated in the HYPE program. Um, so a little through our process, um, the, the first step after someone applies is the assessment. Um, this is our main goal with the assessment is assessing someone's motivation. Um, which is easier said than done. We're really looking at uh, stages of change and where people are. Are they um, in a preparation stage? Are they active? Um, are they ready to make these changes and make these career enhancements um, and move forward? We want graduates to be, to have the tools and the skills to maintain without, without us, hopefully. That's the goal. Um, we're always available, but the goal is that they move beyond us. Um, so how we do that is a couple of different things. We have a comprehensive psychosocial assessment really focused on employment and housing history. And then we spend a lot of time with people developing the specifics of that 24 month employment plan. And we do this well before we even consider someone for enrollment. Um, if someone just says, I wanna go back to school, we need to look at how, when are you doing that? When do you enroll? How are you paying for it? Um, all of these things, you know, we need to work with you to talk to an advisor, to look into financial aid. Because if you don't do that, beforehand, that, that process alone can take many months um, and really eats away at our 24 month timeline. Um, so we really are creating a plan that can realistically be achieved or at least um, had some, someone can make significant progress on within 24 months. Um, so part of the second part of the assessment and how we kind of start structuring some accountability is after that first assessment, developing that plan, um, we make a housing stability plan. So that's our version of a individual service plan or a treatment plan. Um, and we really have goals, objectives, action steps, really focused on creating that employment plan. Um, and that's kind of how, that's our first test of accountability. Can you follow up with these timelines that you and I both agreed on? Um, can you take these steps forward? If you can't, this program might not be a good fit for you because you really are expected to keep progressing throughout the program. Um, so with all of those steps, the assessment timelines really varied for in, from applicant to applicant. Some people came in with a solid plan, didn't really need a lot of support. Um, other people needed more support and we're, we're fully prepared and willing and able to provide that support to really help people make that cohesive plan. Because a lot of people have never been asked, what's your dream career? What, what do you want to do with your life? Um, so we spent that time really flushing that out with people. 
Um, so then next step would be enrollment. So internally, we, we have an internal review board that looked at every component of someone's employment plan, their history. Um, and if we decided they were appropriate, we uh, sent a proposal to our funders who um, would, would either approve or deny enrollment. Um, from there, we, um, we allotted 60 days to full enrollment. So the intention with the 60 days is to provide a, a cushion of time to enable people to find housing, to take steps on their housing stability plan, to address any um, outstanding rental balances. The, the applicants that we had, there was a variety of housing situations when they applied. Some people were rent burden, some people were at risk for eviction, some people were in transitional housing. Um, so we used that 60 days to really resolve those emergencies. So once they were in the program, they weren't at risk for eviction. Um, and most importantly, the 60 days was intended to give people enough time to find the housing. Um, and as mentioned, there's, we did this with wraparound support services. We were there every step of the way, making sure people got through that 60 days. Um, so the, the meat of the program, what, what does the program provide? Um, the biggest intervention is probably the housing. Um, our program pays 100% of the rent. So whatever that lease agreement is, um, the leases are in the participant's name, but while you were in the HYPE program, we take on the rent. Um, then participants are responsible for a rental contribution. So that's equal to 30% of their income, but all of that goes into an escrow account. So this is a huge and very unique opportunity to build personal capital. I've seen a lot of programs with like small percentage escrow accounts. Um, this method really allowed people to build large sums of personal capital and ultimately uh, turn this program into, I like to think of it as a prevention intervention. With personal capital and these skills, you really have an opportunity to potentially prevent future cycles of poverty. Um, so on top of housing and escrow, obviously we provided employment support. Um, the financial contributions for employment support were pretty small. We typically sought to leverage other community resources, but we did occasionally provide um, like uh, support with transition or transportation or supplies. Um, the program is not prepared to pay someone's college tuition. That's not, we don't have the financial capacity to do that. The main financial intervention is the, is the rent, is the housing. Um, but we were very, we provided support in seeking those other funds in order for people to progress on their goals. Um, and then we have our supportive services. So our supportive services, um, the main component was our intensive case management. Um, that was support that provided accountability. Um, we implemented quite a few mechanisms of accountability. So we have a very comprehensive program agreement. So that really sets the stage of this is the HYPE program. This is what you need to do. Um, and if you don't, you may not be eligible to continue, stay, continue uh, receiving services from this program. So we have a very strict program agreement. We're very transparent. Um, and then another mechanism of accountability is our housing stability plan. So that's the collaboratively developed plan, your employment plan um, that tends to be, that is at minimum updated every six months, but it's more frequently updated as people progress. Um, so these are all systems to really keep people on that, that agreed upon track. Um, so other interventions, HDS is a HUD certified counseling agency. So if you aren't a HUD certified counseling agency, they tend to be in most jurisdictions. Um, so be, we're lucky to have uh, specialized workshops and counselors in-house that can really walk people through all, all of housing services. Um, so credit, money management, home ownership. Um, in addition to those, um, we offered voluntary group meetings for HYPE participants. The, the topics really ranged and were determined by the participants and what they wanted to learn more about. Um, we provided comprehensive, you know, referral services. Um, we were really trying to create a support network and a treatment team. Um, we did coordinate with employment agencies. HCS is a housing agency. And so while this is an employment program, um, people tend to enter with a, a pretty straightforward employment plan. But when there was additional support needed, we obviously coordinated with um, any and all uh, outside resources. So that included employment agencies, mental health providers. Obviously, we we're in touch with medical providers. Um, we, we connected people with small business trainings, anything beyond our purview, we, we made sure that people had wraparound support. And then this is a pretty um, bit major component of height is um, helping people kind of recognize cycles of reactive behavior. So the impact that stress and trauma has on our brains and our ability to um, think forward and plan. Um, so we really try to educate and tie back to when someone's making reactive behaviors and then trying to kind of shift um, the, the, with meeting the basic needs, with an individual's basic needs, and we're thinking about the hierarchy of needs, 
the goal is really providing some space that people can stop and think and you know do i how can i move forward in my career how can i manage my finances um, so really trying to help people expand their mindfulness tools um, and really make some intentional decisions about their life moving forward um, so yeah and it, on that same note a big part of needing to be proactive is kind of thinking about that escrow account um, people are some people are leaving with large sums of money um, my, my one of the case managers kind of said it perfectly we don't want the escrow account to be um, a remember when I had all that money we want to want it to be more like look at what I built with all this money with this opportunity I had so we're really looking at financial planning and future planning and thinking forward um, so how we tie all this together is um, like I said we have a lot of mechanisms mechanisms of accountability with um, engagement um, and just moving forward with on that housing stability plan. Um, ultimately, failure to progress is means that you're non-compliant with the program. And so when you're non-compliant, that puts you at risk of termination. Um, we have three warning stages before termination. We, our goal is to prevent anyone being involuntarily uh, exited from this program prior to their 24 months. So we will engage and engage and engage and really support and support um, and many people have been non-compliant, but no participants have been terminated before their 24 months. Um, the non-compliance and that period is really time for all of us to sit down. So the treatment team sits down, be like, look, this is what you said you wanted to do. This barrier popped up. It's obviously throwing you off. How do we get you back on track? Is this still the track you wanna be on? How do we keep it moving? So that's the main goal of all of our systems of accountability. Um, so then our outcomes. So in 2019, 11 participants finished um, their, their 12 months in height. So these individuals, like I said, were transferred from another program. So they weren't selected using the height criteria, um, but they were a big part piece of what height is today. Um, so even though they weren't selected with this criteria, they didn't come in with the most cohesive employment plans. We still saw positive outcomes in regards to their income. Um, personal capital development, so building that escrow fund up, um, health maintenance and improvement, and we saw life skill development. So escrow accounts range from uh, a little over 3,000 to over 20,000. And so that, keeping in mind, people always pay 30% of their income. So if some people are in school, if they don't have income, they're paying zero, um, or if they have unemployment, they're paying zero. So people had different contributions throughout. Um, three individuals progressed towards associates or bachelor's degrees. Um, overall client feedback reported that they felt more confident with their credit, their credit, their budgeting, their self-advocacy, ability to, re to navigate community resources. Um, it's important to note that majority were still severely rent burdened when they left the program. So although incomes increased, we are in a high cost area as has been mentioned. Um, so people were still rent burdened, but even though people are still rent burdened, um, updates with clients show that the majority are still, have still been able to maintain their housing. Um, and we have seen two individuals um, who have sought rental assistance due to temporary lapses in employment, but even those individuals had very clear ways to get back on track. Um, so then the current status. Um, so since we started enrollment in May 2018, we enrolled seven new participants. They will be completing this year and in early 2021. All participants are engaged in vocational or educational activities. Um, these, this was the group that they had to come in with that really cohesive employment plan. Um, they had to meet that minimum criteria. Um, they really went through the whole program as I've described it. Um, so four participants have been working and attending school. So this is, like I said, a group of very motivated and very impressive people. Um, they just really needed some stability to really do all the things that they're very well capable of doing. Um, one graduated with their bachelor's in December 2019, one graduated with their MSW in May 2020. Both those individuals have increased their income since graduating. Um, we've seen consistent progress throughout the program. Um, it doesn't mean there haven't been barriers. We've had periods of unemployment. We've had, we've had things pop up, school programs not work out. People take one path and they say, like, this isn't working for me. Um, and that doesn't mean that you're non-compliant with the program, it means that we have to pivot and we just, we shift and we keep moving forward. And so people have been, we've been able to engage people around ways to keep moving forward and keep moving towards those goals of increasing their income. Um, and then we've seen really positive um, outcomes with life skill development. So people are just much more confident with credit. We have people who are 
really close to home ownership. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think it's going to happen with it, like right out of the program, but they are so close. And I, I would comfortably say within a year or so of exiting the program, um, they will be homeowners. Um, so some small business owners have really developed their finances around their small businesses and are starting to expand. Um, so like I said, a group of really impressive people who really just needed a shot, um, some stability to, to be able to really achieve all the things that they were fully capable of, but just life, you know, life gets in the way. Um, so some of the program challenges, so this is observations and feedback from clients, um, some barriers to implementation. With our stringent criteria, it's not the easiest to find the most appropriate candidates. Um, so we've, we've kind of stepped back from that. We get applicants who don't have a GED, um, who maybe don't have the full employment history requirement. And we, you know, every application we get, every person that engages us around this program, we put the time in to really look at their whole situation. Um, and do, you know, can you come up with a plan? Um, are, you, are you showing that you're a motivated person? Um, so we, we are looking at, we definitely look at the person holistically. Um, so again, feedback, program stringency, um, some feedback from the first 11 is, you know, you want me to be independent, but you're requiring that I do this and this and this and this, and you're kind of like my helicopter parent. Um, so we, we took that feedback. And so we start, we kind of have a system of tapering engagement requirements as people progress. So if you're doing everything and you're consistent and you're consistently taking steps forward, you don't need to see us face to face all the time. Um, we can, you know, we adjust. Um, and then timeline, uh, we do only have 24 months. So like I said, we have to really come we have to put the work in up front to come up with that plan so that the second you're in height you hit the ground running um you have that 24 months and you 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 know you're, you're working on that plan that you came up with um so successes like i said we saw a lot of positive outcomes with the first cohort we're seeing that the current cohort is on a positive trajectory um i think really important and i've already touched on this a little bit is we've seen some really powerful things in financial literacy development I think a big part of it is people can just slow down and they're not as panicked. They're not as worried as how is, uh, about how my rent is gonna get paid. Um, and so they, they've, you know, we've seen people make some really, start to make some really good financial decisions. Um, and, you know, like I said, we're trying to prepare people to make those good decisions with the escrow account. Again, that um, we're seeing the impact of a prevention intervention where this program, again, could prevent people from staying in the cycle of needing assistance or, you know, getting near eviction every couple of years. Um, so we are seeing those positive outcomes. Um, and so Baron's going to take over a little bit for some macro considerations for implementation. Yes, thank you, Jordan. So cer certain things that you want to consider in endeavoring to do a program similar to the height program. First of all, you must know your community. Familiarize yourself with census data, Bureau of Labor Statistics data to get a sense of what are the industries and occupations within your local community and what would be some of the skills that persons would need to get entry level jobs in those industries. Also, in many of our citizen participation meetings with uh, persons living with HIV, we have a lot of self motivated individuals who want to become entrepreneurs and start their own jobs. So therefore, you also have to establish connections and contacts with your local government and know the people who deal with employment and businesses and, and filing and getting papers established so that you can become a legitimate business. In that way, some of the hassles and frustrations with starting your own business or finding a educational program, a training program in college or a junior college or a community school, uh, you can assist your participants in overcoming those hurdles so they won't get burned out and frustrated so quickly. So those are some of the key things at the macro level you want to consider. In most of your high housing cost areas, you're going to be a high urban area, and most likely you're going to have a lot of office occupations. So any computer skills training with Microsoft, Office, and the like, um, those would be entry-level opportunities where your persons can uh, find some employment and become motivated. And if not get off of the subsidy program, at least they'll have something that they can call their own and have something to look forward to every day. And that's generally what we're trying to do to accomplish with these programs. Jordan? Yeah. And so just on a more individual level, um, like Mr. Fox said, HCS has a lot of um, 
programs. We, we have a lot, of, we have a range of housing programs. We're right in the middle of the housing continuum. Um, so just recognizing that this program is not appropriate for everyone. And that doesn't mean that they don't get services, right? It doesn't just because you're not appropriate for height doesn't mean that maybe you're just not appropriate for height yet. And maybe the first step is uh, transitional housing or some other lower, lower requirement program um, where you can start building up towards that. Um, so in our experience, it, it may not be appropriate for the majority of your homeless population, depending on what, um, what, what's going on with your homeless population. We do have individuals who would fall into the homeless category, um, but the majority were just not quite ready to take, to go yeah, from street level homeless to um, full-time employment. Some were, um, some were So, you know, we kind of think of this, again, this is one piece in your, your continuum. And so maybe transitional to stabilize a little bit and start building, start working and then you go into something like height. Um, so yeah, like I said, our participants majority fell into temporarily stable or at risk categories. Um, so without this program, realistically, some may have, could have ended up homeless, some could have maintained with some support. Um, but what we're seeing is that with this program, like I said, prevention wise, um, you know, this two years of input and time um, has potentially moved them out of this continuum and moved them beyond this continuum. And that really is what the goal of height is. Um, so, and just in a high cost area, just really leveraging, Grant touched on this a little bit, leveraging your housing resources. Um, DC has quite a few workforce housing programs. So again, those are the programs that are for middle income earners. Um, and so tax credit buildings, we have an inclusionary zoning program, affordable dwelling. Um, these are not vouchers. These are not subsidized. They're just, they're capped at a slightly below market rate um, housing. So programs like that are going to be really important to you need to be aware of them, you need to know how to connect people, and you need to work with people while they're in the programs just to better ensure future housing stability. I think that is, oh, I think you're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Baron and Jordan, again, for uh, allowing us an opportunity to really hear about the program and the, some of the challenges that we face here in the D DC EMSA. So please, if you have any questions or any concerns or comments or recommendations or even suggestions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email address is anthony.fox at dc.gov. Very simple. Again, it's anthony.fox at dc.gov. And I will do my best to answer those questions and get that information back to you. Thank you so much for allowing us this time to share with you our housing independence through employment program here at the DC Department of Health. Have a great day. Welcome to our session entitled Vocational Needs and Intervention Models for People Living with HIV, Research Findings and Recommendations. My name is Liza Conyers and I'll be presenting today with Jen Chu and Kathy Malsby. We are all affiliated with the Research Working Group of the National Working Positive Coalition, which is a resource for employment supports and technical assistance for uh, work and HIV related issues. Today, we will provide an overview of the client focus considering work model and how this model has been applied as a framework for common threads a vocational and HIV prevention intervention for African-American women. Dr. Chu will then discuss the, some findings from the National Working Positive Coalition Employment Needs Survey, and Dr. Molesby will share findings from a quality, qualitative study examining the exploration of employment among Black and gay bisexual men living with HIV. One of the most challenging questions faced by individuals with HIV is how and when to make critical decisions regarding employment. The client focus considering work model provides structure for both professionals and clients to better understand this complex decision-making process and to have a framework to assess key issues and factors that may influence or help to inform the process. The initial model was developed by Goldblum and Kohlenberg in 2005, specifically to address the needs of people living with HIV. It was revised by Conyers in 2018 to address all individuals with emergent 
and or episodic disability. This model is based on a comprehensive review of the vocational rehabilitation literature and theories of behavior change. It's been empirically validated through several research studies. As noted in the title of this model, the, this approach is client-centered and does not presume that work is beneficial for all people living with HIV. The model proposes that people begin, people living with HIV begin to engage in con the considering work process when they perceive a pressure to change due to life circumstances. The pressure to consider making a change in work status originates from one of four domains of influence, medical, financial legal, psychosocial, and or vocational. Each domain can serve as a barrier or facilitator of employment. The model can be applied to individuals making transition into or out of employment. However, the focus of the presentation today will be on people living with HIV who are considering transitions from not working to paid employment. In this context, engaging in the considering work process will begin when the person feels some pressure, perhaps improved health, need for money, boredom, to make a transition from unpaid to paid employment. As you can see in the middle of the figure here, a key component of the model is, is including the adaptation of change theory to define phases of considering work. The proposed phases of considering work provide an organized approach to evaluating and progressing through a thoughtful sequence of questions and activities to facilitate a comprehensive vocational decision-making process. As you can see from the arrows in the figure, this is a non-linear process and individuals may progress up and down or across the different phases of considering work. The first phase, contemplation, focuses on the question, is any change feasible? In this phase, individuals consider pros and cons of being employed, but have not yet decided if work is a good option. Two key issues this phase to, to address during this phase would be to, de to determine if work is feasible option and to consider if the benefits of working would outweigh the potential risks. The primary focus of phase two, preparation, is to determine what kind of change is best. There's two steps to this process. The first is to set a goal and make a plan. Review of the vocational development theory provides strong support for the importance of vocational goal setting as a unique and distinct phase in the vocational development process. For one, having clear goals can help facilitate and maintain motivation. It's important that the goals not be so narrow they fail to be engaging or so broad that they're overwhelming. So the next phase is preparation. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, I skipped. So that the um, part B of preparation is to uh, prepare for employment. So often at the onset of illness, changes in functionality, vocational interests, as well as a need for workplace accommodation may require that there's some time spent in vocational exploration or pursuing additional education or training. So once the preparation phase is complete, the action phase would be to actively seek for paid employment. For example, sending out resumes, going on job interviews and so forth. So it's not that everybody has to go through each of these phases sequentially. Some folks may be ready to go right into action. And sometimes after preparing and doing an internship, a person may decide that they want to reevaluate their plan and set new goals. The resolution um, phase has three components. Secure work, where the person expects to maintain their job over the next year and is satisfied and stable work. Insecure work is where the, the job is temporary, unstable, 
or there's concern about the ability to remain employed. And finally, there's the option of um, resolving the pressure to change through non-paid employment or other options. So again, it's, it, there's not a goal to attain work necessarily. And sometimes after going through this process, a person may make the, a decision that it's best for them not to work, perhaps volunteer or focus on their health or other, other goals. So um, there, the foundations for the original um, considering work model emerged from an eight week vocational intervention group called Making a Plan. And this um, group was studied and found that after completing this group, individuals had reduced vocational concerns, decreased feelings about being unprepared or hesitant about going to work, and had made progress towards their vocational goals. Conyers and Boomer also validated the study empirically and found support for, the, for, the, for this research, I mean, for this model. The considering work model has also been applied to getting to work an online training curriculum for HIV service providers and housing providers. It was used as a framework for the program evaluation of Foundations for Living, an integrated employment and housing intervention. And it was used as a framework for the program evaluation of Common Threads, an integrated HIV prevention and vocational intervention for African-American women. And it has also been used for the development of the NWPC Vocational Development and Employment Needs Survey. So I'm just gonna speak very briefly about Common Threads. It's a peer led HIV training that addressed social determinants of health as an integrated prevention, trauma informed and vocational development training. And there are a number of different phases to this model. In the first phase, the uh, individuals got together to reflect on their lives and get a deeper understanding of what made them more vulnerable to exposure to HIV. And that we can consider in the considering work framework. People were not specifically had made decisions about employment, but as they had gained a better understanding of their selves and increased self-esteem, many of them expressed an interest in work. And that brought us into phase two, the micro interface phase, where, the, um, where there was training provided sort of in the preparation mode to um, teach women skills to make jewelry and other wares that they could sell. And then moving into three, sort of the action phase, where, where these women um, sold their goods at uh, major conferences. So with that as an overview of the Considering Work model, I'd like to uh, pass the floor to Dr. Chu, who will discuss the um, Vocational Development and Employment Needs Survey. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is Jen Chu. Uh, so um, Dr. Carnius and I, along with other NWPC members, we developed this um, vocational development and employment needs survey. Um, we will be sharing some research findings and some application with you all. So this is a cross-sectional survey designed by NWPC members. Our goal is to understand employment needs, use of vocational services, and also factors associated with considering work um, among individuals with HIV. We also would like to, would like to understand uh, how employment uh, impact their health and also health-related quality of life. We send our recruitment email, email uh, via the HIV network listserv and HIV service organization in various states. Uh, we are still collecting data because uh, we would like to get a representative sample. Uh, but this current data analysis was collected in 2018 and 2019. After participants complete the 30 to 40 minutes online survey, each of them received $15 e-gift cards. 
So um, in 2018 and 2019, a total sample of 490 individual completed the survey. Um, the majority uh, sample are um, black, non-Latino, male, and who completed two years or less college education. Heterosexual, living in urban area. And we have approximately half employed individual and unemployed individual at the time they complete the survey. So we also look at um, some details among the employed groups and also the unemployed. Among the 250 employed individual, uh, most of them report they were working as a salary employee. Um, and also 30% re report as hourly wage employee. Others are stipend, self-employed, or uh, performing informal employment. Um, among the employed individual, 82% of them have access to health insurance. Um, however, uh, approximately half of them report that medical appointment conflict with their work schedule. Uh, and also half of them work in HIV field, uh, including working in HIV service organization, uh, working in uh, social services or any uh, related field. 38% of them report they need reasonable job accommodation. And we also ask them about their feeling about their current employment, whether secure or insecure in the next year. So uh, about half of them report feeling insecure of their current employment. And we ask about the reason of perceiving job insecurity. Uh, approximately 70% of them say lack of support at work, poor work environment, or job is too demanding. And over 60% of them say unstable health or other health concern. Uh, so as here you can see not only health will be um, a factor of their in job insecurity, but also work environment and also um, the work support. And we, when we look at the two 31 unemployed individual, 83% uh, of them say they have work or pay in the past. Among these people who say they have work uh, in the past, 75 say they stopped working because of their HIV diagnosis or other health concerns. Um, and among all the unemployed individuals, um, over 55% of them believe they are able to work for pay in the future. Um, and 58 of them, 50% of them are interested in joining the formal job market. And then we ask, uh, we ask them about what do you need to be able to work? and then we list a uh, tons of services. Um, so among the services, the top one is job training and education. Over 50% of them say they would like job training and education to be able to work. Um, about 30% of them say they need career counseling and benefits counseling. And then we look at uh, factors associated with this individual's health-related quality of life. Uh, because we found that literature indicate health-related quality of life is associated with their health status and overall well-being. So we use the short form job to assess their quality of life, and we use the considering work model to identify the independent variable. Um, so these are all the variables we include in the model. Our results show them um, among these domain. Uh, the demographic factors are uh, ethnicity and education. Individuals who identify as Latino uh, have lower quality of life compared to non-Latino. Individuals who have a um, bachelor degree, um, they have lower quality of life compared to others. Psychosocial uh, support services. Individuals who receive non-medical psych uh, psychosocial or other support services report lower degree of quality of life. We think this may be because um, individually, um, they may be in need to receive these services. So for the sake of time, not going into details for each variable, but within the vocational domain, we define them 
the, their perceived ability to work is um, related to quality of life. Individual who say they are able to work, um, they have higher level of quality of life. So the implication uh, for this study is uh, we saw that half of them, half of the unemployed individuals say they are interested in working and they also need a job training or education. And about half of the employed individuals, they report insecure employment. Uh, so we think that it's important for service provider to actively assess individuals' failure to and to obtain or maintain employment in order to provide adequate vocational support or services. And we also found perceivability to work is positively associated with quality of life. Uh, so we should really understand their current level of um, workability and also their interest in going back to work. Uh, now I'm turning over to Dr. Mosby. Uh, she will be sharing a qualitative study looking at uh, individuals' perspectives on employment. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Um, my name is Kathy Mosby. I am an associate scientist um, with the behavior of health with the Department of Health Behavior and Society at Johns Hopkins University. And today I will be sharing some findings from a small qualitative study um, that looks is an exploration of employment among black, gay, and bisexual men living with HIV. So we know that, HIV, that employment is a key social determinant of health. Um, the populations in the United States that are most impacted by HIV also have unequal access to education and employment, which contributes to HIV-related disparities. Black, gay, and bisexual men are one of the groups that are most heavily burdened by HIV, um, and HIV will have important implications for employment patterns and trajectories of Black, gay, and bisexual men over the life course. So the research question that we'll focus on today uh, that we'll try to answer is what are the facilitators of employment among black, gay, and bisexual men living with HIV who are currently employed. And this work is really guided by two frameworks. Uh, Dr. Conyers has already introduced the considering work model. That is one of the frameworks that we use for this. Uh, the second framework um, is a resilience framework or lens. Um, Public health often uses a deficits lens, um, and we thought it was really important to focus on resiliencies to look at facilitators of employment. Uh, the methods that we used for this work, um, we conducted in-depth qualitative interviews. In total, we interviewed 20 black, gay, and bisexual men living with HIV. Um, of those 29 are employed, um, and the data that I talk about today will be coming uh, from those nine interviews. Again, we focused on employed folks because we did want to take that resiliency approach and really think about facilitators. And in the analysis, can you go back one slide? Um, in the analysis, we used the sort and sift, think and shift um, method of analysis, which includes reading for immersion, some written reflection through the development of participant uh, profiles, lots of memoing, lots of diagramming, um, and then threading and bridging of uh, key topics and themes to see what really cut across interviews uh, for cross-cutting findings. Next. So just to provide an overview of some participant demographics, we're skewed slightly towards older folks, uh, folks over the age of 50. The majority of the people we spoke with um, work part-time, have public insurance, have uh, some college or college, a lot of folks with associate degrees. Um, uh, all of the individuals that we spoke with uh, were virally suppressed and roughly one third were um, currently uh, receiving SS or SSDI benefits. So within the medical domain, men really described illness as being at the forefront of their minds when making decisions around employment. Um, they certainly anticipated episodes of illness. The episodic nature of HIV was really seen as a driving factor for a range of employment related decisions, including the types of jobs that men chose, um, considerations related to full-time or part-time work, um, and also considerations related to career advancement. Um, um, 
an, an additional um, theme really was the relationship between employment and health. Um, men found that meaningful employment was something that um, motivated them to achieve and maintain their health. And this often happened through increased feelings um, of self-worth. Next slide. Um, in addition, men perceived um, that employment was something that improved mental health. There were really sort of three pathways that we saw this happening through. The first being cognitive acuity. The second being um, employment as a coping strategy for disruptive events, including um, HIV diagnosis itself. Um, and also um, employment being something that provided um, structure and routine. Next slide. Within the psychosocial domain, um, having and leveraging social networks for employment um, was really seen as an important facilitator for job um, attainment as well as for promotion and advancement, as were relationships with mentors. Um, particularly, this is particularly salient, I would say, for mentors who are within the community, who are members of the community, um, who served as role models um, and were able to, to provide um, sort of uh, informational support um, as well as social support. We saw a range um, of sort of financial motivators, um, everything from the need to cover one's basic needs um, to motivators that were more related to a desire to improve one's standard of living. Next slide. As well as motivators related to financial responsibility for children, for family members, including chosen family, and for the broader community. Next slide. More than half of the participants that we spoke with had been or were currently receiving SSDI or SSI. And the flexibility of SSDI and SSI to allow folks to work part-time while still maintaining all of their um, benefits, in particular health benefits, was something that really facilitated work and often facilitated a transition um, to full-time employment as well. Um, I would say SSDI and SSI were also seen as resources that increased access to education um, and employment resources, in particular uh, vocational rehabilitation services, which was seen as something that was critical um, for achievement of employment related goals. Within the vocational domain, um, several themes emerged around characteristics of jobs that really facilitated employment. These include flexible work schedules, um, sort of ability, uh, uh, availability and access and quality of uh, res reasonable accommodations, um, having a supportive work environment. Next slide. Um, as well as living, in, uh, working in an um, environment that really valued lived experience um, and also that valued employee input. Across all the interviews conducted, men described a passion for their jobs um, and confidence in their ability to perform their jobs well. So when we look at the implications um, of this work, of these findings, we found that the facilitators of employment really did align nicely with the four domains that were outlined in the considering work model. Many of the facilitators that were identified, I think are amenable to public health intervention and could be incorporated into health programs. Also, though we interviewed folks who were employed, I think the findings could also uh, potentially be applicable to individuals who are unemployed but considering work. Um, and also, I think, certainly speak to the experiences um, of folks who are employed and want to um, maintain employment or in, 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 are interested in um, career change or career advancement. And the study findings really elucidated as well some potential pathways through which employment could impact health. Um, in particular, I would say mental health. So um, sort of a wrap up and conclusion, thinking about the, the three presentations today. Um, in summary, we found that the considering work model is a practical, incredibly useful framework to help understand and assess barriers and facilitators to work. Understanding the facilitators to work can inform intervention development. 
It is important for HIV service providers to actively assess people living with HIV's interest in going to work and barriers to obtaining or maintaining employment in order to provide adequate support. And more research is needed to really better understand the mechanisms through which employment impacts health and vice versa. Our contact information is here. We would like to thank you uh, for your presence, for your time and attention today. And we really look forward to having a discussion for our research uh, with you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sylvester Askins, Jr., and I'm the CEO of Moving Forward Consulting. I'll be talking this morning about a pathway to independence, a pilot program I've developed for the University of Virginia Department of Medicine Infectious Disease Clinic. I'm happy to be joined today by my colleagues from NWPC, which is the National Working Positive Coalition, April Watkins and Mark Misrock. April is the Managing Director of Workforce Development Programs at Gay Men's Health Crisis in New York City, which she'll discuss today. April and I are also serve as co-chairs of the NWPC Employment Services Working Group, which connects representatives from HIV employment programs and related initiatives. April and I are also members of the Board of Directors of the National Working Positive Coalition. We'll be joined by Mark Misrock, the Executive Director of National Working Positive Coalition, who will discuss existing resources in your community that can help address employment-related information, training, and service needs of people living with HIV. Please share your questions for us and information about local HIV employment initiatives in the meeting chat. So let's get started. And once again, thank you. So the title of our, our topic of our session today is Responding to Employment Needs of People with HIV, Addressing Disparities, Improving Well-Being, and Ending the epidemic. Again, my name is Sylvester Askins. So just a little bit of background and how we came to this pilot program. For about seven years, I ran a ticket to work program at a Center for Independent Living in Norfolk, Virginia. Over the years, I was noticing that I was not getting individuals living with, with HIV coming into our program. And I also noticed that there was no targeted marketing towards this particular population of which I was a part of, and that really troubled me. So in 2017, I had the opportunity to travel across the state of Virginia to share information about the Ticket to Work program in each of Virginia's five health districts. That went over very well. It was accepted, it was received very well. And the next year I had the opportunity to travel again across the state of Virginia and talk specifically about HIV and employment. And what I came to understand was that there was a lack of knowledge in my own HIV community about what it would take for individuals like myself living with HIV to return to the workforce. Hence, we have a pathway to independence, a pilot program at the University of Virginia Department of Medicine Infectious Disease Clinic. So this program is funded through Ryan White Part B under Psychosocial Support Services. Like I said before, it's a pilot program designed to help people with HIV on social security disability who want to begin their journey to independence 
from social and entitlement programs. That word independence is not misspelled. Is it intentionally spelled with an E to focus on actually ending our dependence on social programs and entitlement programs, which were not set up for long-term use by individuals with disability. They were meant to be a short-term help while we try and get our lives back together. So this program provides benefit counseling to help these individuals as they begin to look at moving towards economic stability. And I feel it's so very vital that those of us living with HIV really begin to take a serious look at our economic stability. So this benefits counseling allows people with HIV to make informed decisions about their economic future. And it's all about access to the information that we need, information and resources that we need to make informed decisions. As you may know, HIV is no longer a social security defined disability. What this means is that many people with HIV are having to look at going back to work for the first time in many years. This could be because of an upcoming continuing disability review, or it could be the result of loss of benefits after a continuing disability review. Our program does not provide employment services. However, it provides people with HIV the information they need to explore how working will affect Social Security disability benefits. When receiving Social Security disability benefits, there are quite a few parameters that you stay within to have to continue to be able to get those benefits. Benefits counseling is an important part of giving you the information that is needed in order to stay within those parameters. Benefits counseling is a crucial component for people with HIV who wish to take charge of their economic futures. We're living longer, we're living better, and I believe it's really, really important that those of us who live with HIV take a serious look at what we want the rest of our lives to look like. And when we do that, one of the very important things that we must look at is our economic future. The more people with HIV know how their future plans will affect their disability benefits, the more able they are to make, once again, well-informed decisions. The program also assists people with HIV to make realistic, timely, and attainable decisions. Let's look at realistic for a second. Many people with HIV have been out of the work world for many years. So we might not have a good idea or a good grasp on what it's gonna to take to go back to work and not just work, but to make a living wage. So we have to go into, into this process with a realistic idea about what it is you wanna do. So then let's take a look at timely. Because so many people or many people have been out of work for a long time, they may need to get trained or retrained. Some people may need to go back to school to get new skills. This could mean certifications. It could mean vocational training. It could mean degrees. It could be a whole myriad of things, but this takes time. 
So we also need to take a serious look at the time it will take to help us attain those future goals that we want for ourselves. People with HIV who are seeking work are referred to our local partners to assist them in attaining their employment goals. When looking at going back to work, it's very, very important that we set goals for ourselves. Goals that are realistic, goals that are timely, and goals that are attainable. And our partners that we work with assist these individuals in making those or creating those attainable employment goals. As we all know, the HIV landscape is changing quickly in 2020. It's important that people with HIV have access to all the resources and information possible to make the best decision about their futures. The benefits counseling offered through the Pathway to Independence Program is a much needed first step towards becoming equipped to make a well-informed decision considering and navigating self-chosen changes for a brighter and more stable economic future for people living with HIV. Thank you for your time. And now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, April. April, please go ahead. Good morning. Thank you, Sylvester. I was sitting here thinking about, you know, my uptightness or my apprehension about doing a video uh, conferences. I normally use the energy of the audience to get me motivated and keep me going but I'm just gonna have to leap out by faith and um, keep in mind that I know this work, I've been doing this work, and I love this work. So again, my name is April Watkins, and I'm the Managing Director of Workforce Development at GMHC. Uh, next slide. GMHC has been around, we were first in the fight. We've been around since the early 80s, and our services continue to grow, and they have exponentially changed. We now also um, enroll and support HIV negative individuals, youth, and the trans community. What I'm most proud of about GMAC is our one-stop brand model where we could actually provide all of our services at one location. And that has been crucial in helping us keep our clients engaged, uh, supported, and just having a, a sense of community. Um, some of our services are uh, supported by Ryan White funds, but employment is not one of them. Next. So we offer services, you name it, we do it. Um, HIV testing and counseling. We have referrals to care, you know, on the day that people test um, positive or even negative, just to talk about the things that they should be informed about. We give information on PEP and PREP. We have congregate meals program. We serve about, uh, before COVID, maybe a thousand meals a day. We have nutritional counseling and we also offer pantry. We have a legal services department that help with immigration. It helps with name change and a whole host of, uh, issues that HIV positive people sometimes come against like discrimination for housing and such. Uh, advocacy is, is huge for us. Mental health, substance abuse, housing, financial management, intensive case management, and of course my favorite, vocational and employment services. Next. What I know is that the consumers, the consumers are the people who asked GMHC to provide employment services. Back in the early days of our employment services, it was the second most requested service in the entire agency. And what we found was that people came in and they said, hey, I maxed my credit cards, I spent all the money out of my bank account because I thought I was gonna die, but I'm still here and now I need some money. And so the workforce program was 
widely accepted and hugely uh, successful. And so those services began in 2003, and we had a large uh, following of individuals who wanted to learn from how we kept our employment services going, how we engaged our population. And I know it's because of the one-stop model brand that kept people coming and giving us the opportunity to engage them in the idea of employment. Um, we saw an increase in the way people behaved or the things that they strayed away from when they became employed and how important it was for them to acclimate themselves back into the world, into the community, you know, as a viable source of, you know, sustainability for their own care and their own lives. And that's, a, that's been a huge success for us. Next. Employment services include the following. So we do a comprehensive needs assessment, and that includes a career plan. And there is where we map out if you're actually ready for employment. If not, we offer things like internships and several types of training to get you to that point where we think you are ready for employment. We provide huge transitional benefits counseling, which is the biggest, biggest issue that people come in when they're looking to get employed. They want to know immediately how that affects their benefits, how much they can make, what that looks like for them. We do a host of uh, job readiness. Uh, workshops. We do resumes, cover letters, thank you letters. We provide reference guidance, financial coaching. We've helped people go from cashing their checks at a check cashing place to opening up a, a bank account and doing direct deposit, teaching them the benefits of that, as well as um, all the tax credits they could, they could act, uh, potentially access once they become employed. We have a Microsoft certification specialist training. Um, and we also provide digital literacy. We have a huge clothing closet, which we accept donations um, for clothes to help people prepare for interviews and also for when they become employed, we allow them to go shopping again and pick out a couple of outfits. We offer employment services, as you know, and a huge uh, retention um, component as well once uh, a person becomes employed. Next. So pre-COVID, we offered all those services I just listed, but we did them face-to-face. -face. So we used to conduct orientations every Monday at 11 a.m. for the different programs, which included the benefits counseling, the career plan development, gathering all the documents that we needed to, to um, uh, document a person's eligibility for what program, because we have several of them. And uh, the financial coaching and the transitional benefits was the biggest and I think most time consuming part of the whole um, assessment portion because then it got more detailed into a person's actual budget. And that's very important. Um, referrals for the, for the Microsoft Office training or actually to job development, which happens based on the vocational case manager's assessment of everything that you provided um, in your comprehensive assessment. And once you are employed, we have a MetroCard pickup which we found was very uh, lucrative in helping us keep people employed and engaged at the first uh, four weeks of employment because that was a huge benefit to help them get back and forth to work. Next. During COVID, all of our services for uh, assessments and enrollment and orientations are done online, which was huge for us. It was uh, a, a longer period, a little more daunting sometimes for clients. And so one of the things we did was a lot of outreach to find out clients' accessibility and access to a computer or a tablet. We tried to make the, we shortened actually condensed the um, assessment process and so that it would be easier to manage online. And then once a person completes the actual assessment, we call them up and we do the career plan over the phone and we access certain information from them, and then we actually set up an appointment to create um, their resume or get them introduced to any of the online activities we had, or actually making referrals to interviews and other um, job readiness activities. Retention has been the most challenging in the um, pandemic, but what we've had is some very uh, supportive and creative staff people from GMAC's Workforce Development Department 
that volunteered to do retention outside. And so what we did was any client who was still working and needed Metro cards, we would pick um, locations that was easier for them to access, where we would provide them with these weekly cards to go back and forth to work. Next. Thank you for having me and for listening. And these slides will be available for you to, you know, look at more closely. And you can also call or email me um, if you have any questions. I would like to introduce the Executive Director of the National Working Positive Coalition, a colleague and a great friend, Mr. Mark Mizrock. Take it away, Mark. Oh, thank you. Um, I so appreciate that, April. Um, thank you for that magnificent presentation. Sylvester, thank you for yours. I so greatly value and appreciate both of you, not just for these wonderful presentations today, but for your extraordinary work. And I'm uh, so pleased to be with you today in this virtual uh, conference presentation. Um, I am uh, the executive director of the National Working Positive Coalition. The NWPC brings together uh, uh, people from around the country who include people living with HIV, service providers, researchers, educators, employers, and advocates who are interested in and contributing to strengthening responses to the employment needs of people living with or at greater risk for HIV. Um, I have been involved in this work um, since I moved myself from being first a client to a volunteer in and then began to work in an HIV employment program um, in 1995. And I really do feel like um, as a person, an, a long time HIV survivor, that my own survival um, through 2020 at this point is to a large extent uh, related to my having been available, able to get access to the employment information services and resources that I needed um, to really pull myself out of some very difficult, tough times. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, well, first, before we move into the, the next slides, I just want to say that what I'm going to talk about with the remaining time in our session are some resources that may be usable by folks in communities where there is no gorgeous HIV employment program um, or initiative like those that have been described by April and Sylvester. Um, but you can still be involved in intervening in the limited access that so many of us living with HIV confront um, in terms of access to the information, the services and the resources that we might need to better understand what our options are related to employment and um, how we can connect to what might be needed and usable to help us achieve goals that we would want to set um, to make change to move into new employment. Uh, there are a number of national systems of services and resources that, that are available in communities from coast to coast in all of the 50 uh, states and the US territories and the District of Columbia. So I'm gonna do a little uh, quick introduction of these so that uh, the, those of you who are tuning in who would be interested in helping open up access to opportunity for the folks that you live in will have more uh, of knowledge about what you may tap into, the relationships you may develop, the collaborations and partnerships you may develop to benefit more of the people living with HIV in your communities so that more of us have a chance to move out of poverty to gain more opportunity beyond what may feel like a very limited scope for so many of us uh, living um, and managing uh, the HIV in 2020. Um, Sylvester, if you could move to the next slide, I'm gonna start by talking about the American Job Centers system. And this is the national network of uh, one-stop career centers that are in virtually every community. They are uh, the local and regional hubs of workforce development services and resources. This is funded under the 
uh, U.S. Department of Labor, and um, very often these uh, career centers are locally branded with a name uh, related to the system locally. Um, you can go to that link at the bottom to find your local American job centers. Um, access to these services does not uh, rely on any disclosure of HIV status or disability or health condition, although they may have specialized services and resources for folks um, with those um, uh, factors in their lives or other barriers to employment. Um, the resources they provide include um, assessment for employment and uh, access to computers, employment and job lead databases, access directly to employers, job search training and support, and referral to a wide range of community partners. Next slide, please. Um, the state vocational rehabilitation programs are, I think, um, one of the least well understood and are certainly underutilized by people living with HIV who would be eligible for the, their services and resources. Um, in every state, there's a vocational rehabilitation program. Here in New York, uh, ours is called Access VR. In California, the system is called the Department of Rehabilitation. In Pennsylvania, it's called the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. In Louisiana, it's called Louisiana Rehabilitation Services. At the bottom is a link to find out about your own state's vocational rehabilitation agency and where their local district offices are located in your community. Um, what is important that I want uh, better understood about what they represent uh, for people living with HIV and for service providers engaged in helping support linkages um, to very substantial services and resources. Um, most often they are thought of as a resource for funding job specific training or education. They can provide help with a wide range of access to job search related services and resources, including all kinds of supplies and equipment, clothing, transportation expenses. Um, they're really focused on an individual assessment and plan development with individuals with a disability who need assistance to obtain their goals for employment. And the process includes developing a job goal and then creating an independent plan for employment, an individual plan for employment um, that really lists out all of these services and resources that would be needed to achieve that goal. And the, your state vocational rehabilitation uh, agency is contracted with a wide range of vendors for providing those services and resources. And it's been very well documented that people living with HIV have historically not uh, participated in accessing really our share of this pie. It's over a billion dollar um, federal program. So I hope to see more of us in the HIV services community a link with our partners in the VR world to help open up access to those services and resources for people living with HIV. Next slide, please. Um, I want to talk about the Ticket to Work program. This was created by the Social Security Administration, very much out of their interest in always helping to support individuals who are receiving either SSI and or, and or SSDI benefits to be equipped and supported to move off of those benefits, although it is not necessary to relinquish benefits to be eligible for these services. Um, the Ticket to Work program it was intended to expand access to services and resources beyond the state vocational rehabilitation agencies for people with disabilities and ha has engaged a wide range of, of providers of employment services and resources 
um, job training, referrals, job coaching, counseling and placement services. Um, the ticket to work providers are called employment networks or ENs. And um, a value to understand is that while an individual who is an SSI and or SSDI beneficiary um, who participates in activating and active use of their ticket um, has uh, the potential continuing disability review suspended during that period that they are indeed active in working towards an employment goal. Next slide, please. Um, you've already heard how critically important it is that uh, those of us who participate in any of a wide range of benefits programs has a chance to get accurate individualized information about any potential interactions between work earnings and um, eligibility for continuation of those programs. Um, there is this na uh, nationwide system of grantees called the WIPA projects, the Work Incentive Planning and Assistance Projects. This was another uh, program that has been funded um, by the Social Security Administration. And the WIPA projects are community-based benefits planning and assistance um, offered to SSI and SSDI beneficiaries who are working and are interested in work. Um, and the project counselors called community work incentive uh, coordinators provide individual support and information on the effect of work on benefits as well as when, how, and what to report to Social Security. That link at the bottom helps you find your local WIPA grantees. Next slide, please. If you go to this online training, you have an opportunity to really build on the information you've heard today. Um, the Getting to Work program was created by the Department of Labor and HUD um, in a, a unique uh, collaboration to create an employment specific online training for HIV service providers and a shortened URL that you can use from the very long one um, is tinyurl.com forward slash getting to work training. And I, I continue to hear from many people how valuable this is for people to build their knowledge and capacity to assist people living with HIV with employment goals. Next slide, please. Just we'll close out our presentation uh, again with great thanks to April and to Sylvester for all of your extraordinary work in your communities as members of the NWPC Board of Directors. Um, and uh, if you go to www.workingpositive.org, you can gain access to more information and link with us. And we'd look forward to um, connecting with many of you who are either engaged in addressing employment needs or are interested in uh, looking at opportunities to advance how you are able to respond to employment needs of people living with HIV in your communities. Thank you so much.